There's no smoking in court. I didn't realize you could see it. You've been with the People's Court for 20, is this your 26th season? I didn't start in season one, I started in season two. Directors are different on all different types of shows, but what does a director of the People's Court do? I get paperwork in advance. I get a copy of the plaintiff's complaint and the defendant's answer to the complaint. So I know basically what the case is about. But you never really know what's going to happen until they actually get in the courtroom and they're standing next to each other. And then, you know, while there's the promise of one day intimacy and then the minute there's no intimacy, boom, everything gets canceled. All the credit cards get canceled. That's not why they you got canceled. You gambled and you didn't win the gamble. That's not what happened. You're That's right. exactly what happened. And I think part of the secret of that is that we don't let these people see each other. Nobody sees anybody until they're actually inside the courtroom. Once the case starts, I just try to capture everything that's going on. I look at it as a conversation and in a conversation, I'm not always looking at the person that I'm talking to. I'm looking at maybe somebody that would be reacting to what's being said. And for me as a director, that's what I find most interesting. And that's the, the little sprinkle of spice that goes on the case. Mm. So you're almost anticipating what's what someone's going to do or say before they say it, or you're just keeping an eye out of what's going on that might be unexpected? Right. To be a good director, you have to be a multitasker. So I always have to be planning like three or four shots ahead of where I am. And I have certain shots that I use as a bridge to get from one shot to another shot, like a wider shot of the courtroom as opposed to going from a single shot to another single shot. And I have control over the pace of the case. That's the timing and that's how quickly the shots change. So if something is very interesting, I might slow down the pace. If something is very intense, I might slow down the pace. If something is not as interesting, I may cut it faster. So it appears to be more interesting. There's little magic that's going on behind the scenes that nobody realizes when they're watching. That's why I love my job so much is because there is so much behind the scenes stuff. If you were here in the courtroom, you would see so much stuff that you never ever see on TV because I control the shot. So I frame the shot for all the stuff that I don't want you to see. We're in a TV studio, so it's three sides of courtroom and we have an open side. You never ever see that open side. You never see the ports where the cameras shoot out of. You never see any of the cameras in the studio at all. That's one of those things that has always interested me because at home, you really don't know what you're seeing. I mean, you're seeing just what the director wants you to see. True, that's true. What I do as a director is I'm in charge of the technical elements of the show. I'm in charge of what you see at home. So I can control the camera shots. I tell the audio guys when to bring the microphones up and you know, I give the lighting cues and all that kind of stuff. I don't control the content of what's being said. I don't have any control over what the litigants or the judge says in the courtroom. Would you be, rather I call you counselor, doctor, or anything else? How about Dr. McCaffrey, you? Your Honor? It creates a tone of respect. Where I'm from, you sort of got to earn that. Guess what? Where I'm from, you're born with it. The only script involved in the show at all is when the litigants first come through the doors. We have a narrator read an announcement as they come down. This is the plaintiff he's suing for so-and-so. Uh, that's the only part of the show that's scripted. Right. So um, let's say a litigant is speaking and then Judge Millian has something she wants to say and she doesn't wait her turn. She just jumps right in. That's and until happened. you see that that's what happened, it's gonna happen to you again. Nah. How do you handle that? It's her courtroom. <laughs> She's the judge. You know, um, I, I don't I don't have an earpiece to her. I have an essay, a stage announced to the studio. So, you know, if something urgent has to be relayed, I can relay that to her. But she is the one that runs the, the case. You know why you and I got off the wrong foot? Because you started your testimony with what? With all due respect. Do you know what judges hear when they hear with all due respect? With all due respect, comma, you blithering idiot. You. Does Judge Millian have any input or does she have any comments when she sees the finished product? I don't think she watches it. I, I really don't think she does. I mean, she might. One thing that we did during COVID was when the judge came back to the courtroom and we had virtual litigants, what I did was I took an extra TV set and I put it off to the side of the screen and I gave her what we call the line cut, which is where all the camera shots change. And the reason that I did that was so that she could have an understanding of where we were in the case, because we present electronic evidence like pictures and we bring those in through a big screen TV and we would send these to our remote litigants as well. And it's, it's you know, I had to cut the show three different ways to the virtual litigants and it was very confusing sometimes so i put this tv in the courtroom so the judge could tell when i had a, her ipad full screen 
and we were looking at pictures or we were looking at text messages and documents. And she never had that um, until just last year out of all the 20 plus years that she's been on the bench. And so, you know, I, I think that that's something that she appreciates and it's something she likes. But does she watch the case that way? No, she doesn't. She's, she's so focused on those litigants. I mean, she's looking right here the whole time. When you live on a high state campus, it's one of the number one party schools. You know, my car has gotten Listen, honey, side. I went to the University of Miami. You I, got nothing on this. Okay? <laughs> Tell me about some unexpected things that have happened over the last 25 years. Some of the unusual things that have happened on the show. When we hired Judge Millian, she was pregnant with her most recent daughter. So we always had to have a bucket by her chair on the bench in case she was feeling ill. And she got sick a couple of times. That stuff happens, but you never see that at home. Some lighter moments. The judge sometimes gets so focused on what she's doing that uh, I think she spilled her coffee a few times on the bench. How do you like aim improperly for your... You'll never see that on television. <laughs> we were doing a car accident case and she was so intent on catching this litigant in a lie and she, you know, she was doing one of these things and she just missed the top step and went boom, almost face down on the floor. We thought that was going to be it. We've had a couple of scuffles in the studio, but it's never come to blows. We have a security team. You know, we have to make sure that we're responsible, that no harm comes to anybody. We had this one case where a man, I forget what he was being sued for, his wife was backstage and didn't want to testify, and the judge made her come out. And the judge started lighting into both of them, and you could just see this woman just, you know, start to do this. And the judge finally threw her out of the courtroom and she was just raging, just yelling and screaming. And the husband grabbed her around the waist and she fell back against the wall, knocked Ed Koch's picture off the wall in the hallway. <laughs> we had a, another guy and the judge caught him in a lie. You see this guy's eyes start to glass over. And then all of a sudden, boom, he just went down on the floor. It wasn't a heart attack, it wasn't a stroke, maybe it was low blood sugar or something like that. But you know, we got to call the medics into the show. We had to call emergency services. They come with the gurney and the judge comes out and she says, oh God, I hope you're okay. And he's laying on the gurney and going, what? <laughs> oh my gosh. How much of that ended up in the show? We aired it. Oh, oh we totally did? aired it. Oh yeah. Wow. yeah. So those, those are some of the unexpected things. One case we had, a guy who bought an accordion from a woman and said it didn't work and he couldn't play it and couldn't describe what was wrong with it and the woman that sold it sold it for her father and she didn't know anything about it the judge asked if anybody could play the accordion litigants have been sworn your honor okay so you love the accordion but you don't play the accordion no a woman in the back row raised her hand and she came up and played that accordion now what are the chances of that happening. We didn't plant her there. She was just there as part of the audience. It's just crazy. And she was really good too. That's hilarious. We had one of the cast members from the Broadway production Wicked come to the studio in the audience because she loved the people's court. Laura Boyes. Boyes. <laughs> Laura happened to have played Glenda the Good Witch on Wicked, which is one of my favorite Broadway plays. Somehow we got word back to the judge that she was out there. She came out and, and she sang a song from the show. And when someone needs a makeover, I simply have to take over. I know, I know exactly what they need. And even in your case, get it? Case. <laughs> People's Court. This is the best day of my life ever. <laughs> Well, let me take you back to my very first week. It was kind of a strange week. They had decided that they were going to replace their courtroom set. And they had built this brand new set that was all like um, brushed aluminum and frosted glass and dark cherry wood. And it was really a very beautiful set. And we're getting ready to do rehearsals on it. And I think we're doing this on a Thursday or something. And then we were supposed to shoot cases the next day. And so I come in and nobody has told me how to shoot the show. I mean, I've watched it on TV, but you know, I don't know which camera shoots what, so I've got to figure all this stuff out on my own. So I come in, I've got it all the way I want it, and we start shooting rehearsals. And in the back row behind me in the control room is David Scott, our executive producer, Stu Billet, who was the executive producer and creator of the show, and Harvey Levin, who was also an executive producer and in, in the studio for all the cases. And they're, they're buzzing in the back row, they're talking. 
and it's it's kind of a low mumble and I can't really understand what's going on and I'm thinking great it's my first day in the chair and I'm screwing it up finally Stu says stop that's it so I turned around and Stu said this just isn't working and he hated the set is what it was he hated the set this brand new set that they had just built so he pulled the plug on that set brought the old Judge Watner set back in. And I believe it was the original Judge Watner set, which we're using now with some modifications. And we set it up and we started shooting on a weekend. And since this was a Saturday, I didn't have any of the regular crew. I had a whole bunch of people that had never shot the show before. <laughs> and it was just, it was a really, really bizarre first week. But then everything leveled out and it, it, it was good. It's so cool because it's it's a tape show, but it's so live. It's such good entertainment, and it's also smart, too. There's never a day that I leave here that I haven't learned something that I didn't know before. You know, we treat the show as though it's live. You know, it's real cases, it's real people. So we treat this as though it's a real court. That has been one of my main points since day one. This is real court. This isn't a TV show. This is real court. And our decisions are binding. You know, everyone on camera seems like people that you would want to get to know, and people at home can feel that. Do you have what I need? Well, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm, I work with a lot of really, really talented people, and and you know, it's it's not me being the director and telling everybody what to do. It's me being the director and helping direct the team because we are all a team. And what you said before is absolutely true. People are out of work after six months to a year on a show. To have a show go on for 25, 26 years is almost unheard of in this business. Any final words on working for the People's Court? Working with Marilyn and now with her husband, John, they're such great people. And, you know, I've, I've been working with her so long, it's like I'm married to her almost. I can read her mind. I, I can tell where she's going. I can tell if she's having a good day, if she's having a bad day. And it just never, ever gets old working with her. I see comments on YouTube all the time. People just adore her. So. Yeah, don't lie, don't lie to her and don't piss her off. Oh, hey, what's one of your favorite phrases of hers? She's got a lot of good ones. Do you have one? She does. Uh, I can't say it in Spanish, but my favorite phrase of hers is, you're scratching me here and it's itching me there. <laughs> I love it. <laughs>